First Corinthians chapter 6 is about uh, judgments among brethren, uh, disputes and controversies among brethren, specifically them taking each other to court over these things uh, and bringing shame on the church, bringing shame on themselves by uh, introducing disputes that should be kept within the church, uh, exposing those to outs people outside the church. And so uh, I have a picture here of somebody taking a, an oath, I guess, on a Bible. I don't know. Does anybody know if they still do that anymore? They still do that? Uh, but oftentimes, as, as laws change in our country, even if you get a, what would consider, the world would consider a just hearing, if it's not in accordance with God's word, it's not what God would consider just. So it's kind of ironic in some ways that people would swear on a Bible and then maybe get some kind of justice in a courtroom that, that's not in accordance with what God would want. So let's start with a way of uh, review for those of you who haven't been here and just a reminder for those who have. <coughs> in chapter 1, uh, Paul introduced the bu book and says that they've been called, the Christians. This is a book by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. He said they were called and sanctified. That word sanctified is just a fancy way of saying they were made holy or they were set apart for God's service. And all that happened in Christ. And, and their problem was, or at least two of their problems, which is a problem for some of our churches today, and none of us are immune to this, is sometimes we may exalt <coughs> men. They were identifying with uh, Apollos and Cephas and, and, uh, and different ones. Paul, uh, instead of just focusing on Christ, and sometimes they would exalt human wisdom, uh, philosophies of men, and that would uh, above the teachings of Christ. Uh, chapter 2, I didn't break down in that same way. It just it kind of all flowed together that he was emphasizing that our faith must be in God's power and not signs. That's the Greeks, I mean the Jews, they sought signs or miracles. Not, our, our faith is not in uh, human wisdom, but it's in God's power. It's the power that transforms our life. It's the power that will eventually raise us from the dead. And he's, he emphasized that God's truth doesn't come from man's wisdom. It doesn't come from philosophy. And so he builds the need for uh, divine revelation. And he's approaching them as an apostle, one who has divine revelation. He says that you know, God's mystery was revealed through his spirit, and that people of the Spirit, the Corinthians, they had the Spirit of God, they do miracles, and they had spiritual gifts. Spiritual people will accept spiritual revelation, and so they won't discount what Paul teaches. And, and some people do that today. They say, well, I'll, I, I, if I have a red-letter Bible, I'll do what Jesus says, but I'm not going to do what Paul says. I don't like what Paul teaches sometimes. But Paul was one sent by God. He had revelation. Uh, he was inspired by the Spirit, so we have to listen to him as well. And spiritual people will accept God's spiritual revelation. And then we moved into chapter 3, he talks about an irony that people who are spiritual but yet divided, it doesn't add up. You know, you can't be both spiritual and divided because God wants spiritual people to be unified. And he said, you know, he had to correct a view of false, a false view of servants. You know, they were, they were taking pride in Apollos or uh, Paul or Cephas. He says all these people are just workers in God's vineyard. You know, one, one planted, one watered. But God was the one that was giving all the increase. And he goes on and he changes the analogy to a building analogy. He says, Jesus Christ is the only foundation. It's the foundation that, I was, that, that he laid, Paul uh, laid. And anyone who builds on that foundation with anything else, uh, anything perishable like gold, silver, precious stones, when a trial comes, and especially in the day of judgment, all those things are going to be uh, wiped away. The only thing that's going to be standing are those things that are built on the foundation of Christ. And we learn elsewhere in the New Testament that we, as Christians, we're supposed to be living stones built upon that foundation. He gives a warning in chapter 3, 16 through, and 17, that anyone who's found, he's saying, you know, you're the temple of God, and anyone who destroys that temple, God is going to destroy it. So that was a warning to individuals as well as the church there. And he reminds them at the end, he said, I don't understand why you're exalting certain workers over another. He said, they all belong to you. They were all sent to Corinth for your benefit. And in fact, all spiritual blessings you have in Christ so they shouldn't be doing this. We went into chapter 4, and he, as a, an apostle, he says that he was appointed as a, as a steward, as an under rower. We talked about that. He was just doing, he wasn't, he wasn't coming of his own accord. He was just doing what God told him to do. And I use the babysitter analogy. If somebody um, doesn't, if a kid doesn't like the babysitter, that's, they're not the ultimate judge. It's the parent who hired the babysitter who's the ultimate judge. And in the same way, it doesn't matter that we don't like what Paul says or that the Corinthians didn't like what Paul says. God was going to be the judge because he was a servant of, of Christ. And he gave the example of the apostles and how they were beaten and how they were hungry and how they were thirsty. 
and how it was really in contradiction to the, what the Corinthians, they were wealthy and they, they weren't suffering for Christ. And he was trying to invite them to really examine the, the example that the apostles had. And he said, that's real faith in Christ, being willing to suffer. So he gives this appeal and exhortation. He appeals to them as a father. He was their father in Christ through the gospel. And he gives them the ex exhortation, which says, I'll give you a choice. When I come to you, it can be the easy way or the hard way. I can come with the rod or I can come with a spirit of gentleness um, of the spirit. And then he goes into chapter 5 and he warns them about expelling immorality. There was somebody there who had a, uh, their father's wife, uh, some kind of sexual immorality. And uh, he says, you know, not even the Gentiles have this kind of immorality among them. And they were taking pride, maybe that they, they were tolerant of this sin. Maybe they thought that, well, now that we're in Christ, we can continue in this sin because all of our sins have been forgiven. Perhaps they thought, well, if we kick them out, we can't have any influence on them. So anyway, they were compromising God's standard. And he says, you have to get rid of immorality from the church. And he gives an analogy of the Passover in, in chapter 5, 6 through 8, which is a Jewish analogy in the Old Testament. During the feast of the Passover, they had to get all the leaven out of their house. The Passover was the feast, um, if you remember in Egypt when they were the ten plagues, the last plague was the killing of the firstborn son. They had to put the, the kill a lamb and put blood on the doorpost, and the angel of death passed over their house. Well, to remember that, that God had spared them, every year they would kill a lamb, and because they had to flee in the middle of the night from Egypt when Pharaoh kicked them out, their bread couldn't rise, to remember that, they would get all the, they would scour everything in the house and get all their yeast out. And so that, for seven days, they would have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And they wouldn't have bread and the, the leaven in their house. So he uses this analogy uh, to say, just like you would scour your house to get rid of all the yeast, because, you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, he says, we can't have any immorality in the church, because it's going to spread and, and, and cause other people to become corrupted. And if you have a corrupt church, even if you put new flour, new Christians into a leavened loaf, they're going to get corrupted as well. And so for us to be the church that we need to be, we have to make sure that we're pure and holy as God intended. And in, in, in verses 9 through 13, he, he calls them, he says, you know, I've already pronounced judgment on them, and you guys should have as well. And he's calling them to judge those within. Remember he said, who judges those without? It's God that judges those without. But I want you to discern... And, and, and bring and hold these people to the standard that they should or else get them out of the church. So that brings us to chapter 6. That was a, a little bit longer introduction, but we got through it. And then he said, uh, I'm going to break this down into, into basically three parts. Shame on the church, shame on the, on the plaintiff and the defendant, the people who are uh, accused of, the people who are bickering, and then warning against all wrongdoers. So let's look at this um, for a moment. If we can just read the first, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and read the first six verses. And keep in mind what's going on here is two people are in the church, at least two people are having some kind of disagreement, and rather resolving it inside the church, they've exposed it to outsiders for judgment. <clears throat> he says, does any, uh, any one of you, when he has a case against his brother, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers." So let's look at this. We need to first ask ourselves this question. How were public disputes settled in Corinth? Well, we have a little insight into this in the book of Acts 18. And we, not too long ago, we had studied uh, Acts uh, together in Paul's missionary journeys. But when Paul was um, in Corinth in Acts 18, the, he made the Jews uh, angry with him. And what the Jews did uh, is brought him before the proconsul. And his name was uh, Gallio. And if you remember, what they were charging him with was that he was persuading, Paul was persuading men to worship people contrary to their law. And, and Galileo, he, he heard this, and he says, you know what, this is matters and disputes of the law, and so you guys just judge it among yourselves, if you remember that. And so what it was, just in a way of reminder, real quick, the Jews brought Paul before the proconsul Galileo, this place called the judgment seat, 
Galileo looked at the matter and he says, look after it yourselves. So even Galileo knew that among the Jews, they should, when it comes to matters of their own law, they should be handling it themselves and not in the courts of law. Here's a picture. This place really exists. If you go to modern day Corinth, and you'll see in the background that mountain is called the Acro Corinth or the Acropolis, and that's where the, the, the great temple uh, was, where all the uh, prostitutes were uh, supposedly that they worship God in or worship their gods in. But here is this raised platform, and up here uh, the pro council would sit in judgment, and the plaintiff and defendants would stumble down here for judgment. Here's another picture of a man standing as if you were looking down there. So this place really does exist. This is where they would go in the court of law in ancient Corinth. And what he's saying here in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, does anyone, he says, really dare any of you do this? Does, you know, the nerve, we would say in our modern English, the nerve of such a man to go to, to, go to law against his brother in a public matter. Uh, he says, having a matter unto, so I was, this is um, literally what it says, you know, in the Greek. Having a matter into somebody, which is a dispute, uh, be judged. This is a phrase, be judged before the unjust. And let me look in verse 1. He says, go to law before the unrighteous. You kind of, in New American Standard, you kind of lose that play on words. But he's saying, would you be judged before people who can't give you justice, uh, according to God? It's not that they would not get a fair hearing according to Roman law, but it's not God's justice. Uh, and he's saying you really should, instead of going and settling this outside, you should settle this internally. So why seek God's justice in the world's courts? Now, we might have a temptation to do that ourselves today. If, um, say, Mike stole my car, you know, uh, and my initial temptation would be, you know, to, you know, I guess the full extent of the law against Mike, rather than trying to resolve that between us. Because, so, see, when two people go show up in court or at the police station and maybe they find out that we're both members of the Wallingford Church of Christ. You see, that's right, shame, shame, shame on this church. And you think, oh, that's the kind of church that there is over there. So why bring judgments before those who will be judged is his next uh, comment. And, and, and verse 2, he says, have you not known, which is a rhetorical question, implying that they should know this. He says, saints or holy ones, they will judge the world. Now, we don't know in which way that we will judge the world, but in, in, in several places in the New Testament, it's, it's alluded to that we will take part somehow, don't know how exactly, with, with being part of God's great judgment on the rest of the world who's wicked. Those who have been made holy and set apart will somehow be part of that judgment. And he asks them, are you insufficient, are you inadequate to judge even these small matters? And what he means by that is in comparison with the kind of judgment that we will take place, we will participate in, whatever matter you may have against your brother is insignificant compared to that. So act like who you are. You know, you're, you've been destined for greatness, for this grand judgment at the end of the world. So can you not handle these things that are mere uh, things about matters of this life? He says, have you not known, which is another rhetorical question in verse 3, we will judge angels. And so he's, a, he's assuming that they will know that. Now, how are we going to judge angels? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically, but in some way, we're going to be involved in this judgment. And he says, not least the things of this life, which are of lesser importance. So when you think about, in perspective, what we're destined to do when Christ returns, we should be able to handle matters of disputes among our brethren. Does that make sense? And that's what he's getting at. Which one's more difficult? Judging the world? <laughs> judging angels? Or judging some small disputes among our own brethren? And, and that's the idea that he's, he's trying to get across there, is that we should be able to handle things among ourselves. So in, in uh, verse 4, he goes on and says, Therefore, do you appoint, and this idea of do you allow other people to sit in judgment of you, these people having been despised by the church, I think maybe King James says something like that, or people who have no account in, in regards to the church, the idea is we would not let these secular judges come in here and tell us matters of God. You know, they would, they would have no bearing on things uh, that are spiritual. They really have no respect among the church, so why are you allowing them to give you judgment? They have no basis for righteous judgment. And so in verse 5, he says, I'm speaking this, really to your shame, so that the desired outcome is that he's wanting to shame them into changing their behavior. 
that's different than what he says uh, in chapter 4 and verse 14 where he's, where he's telling them how much the apostles have been suffering and he says, I don't write these things to shame you, but I'm just trying to admonish you. Here he really is trying to shame them by their behavior to get them to change. And he asks them a, a question. He says, is there no one among you who is wise? And really he's talking about godly wisdom here who's able to judge between his brethren. And isn't that ironic because these are the same people in the, in the Corinth who have been really clinging to worldly wisdom, think they're so wise, think they're so smart, but their actions betray them. He says, do you not have anybody wise enough? It's kind of ironic or maybe sarcastic that he says this. And isn't that true that our actions reveal our true spiritual wisdom? You know, if I say, you know, hey, you know, I'm, you know, I really got myself together, but then Mike sees me doing stuff that's really betraying, you know, who I really am, or, or Rich sees something like that, or Brian sees me acting in a different way that I shouldn't. Our actions reveal our true spiritual wisdom. And in the church in Corinth, they were priding themselves on how spiritual they were. Here they even had spiritual gifts. But their behavior was betraying them as not being as godly as they really thought that they were. So in verse, verse 6, he says, brother goes, against, uh, go, bro, brother goes against brother and he's judged, and that before unbelievers. And so really the shame in it is that the church is, we would say, airing its dirty laundry in public. You know, uh, we, want to, we should be able to handle these things inside. We're trying to evangelize to the local community, and then the church in Corinth was trying to evangelize that local co uh, community. doesn't mean we won't have disputes, but... If we, if we bring reproach outside because we can't handle things inside, it's really airing our dirty laundry in public and that we should be ashamed of that. So the question for us is, do we shame the church among outsiders? Are there things that we may do that would bring reproach? One way would be, uh, let's say me and Grant, maybe Grant uh, are business partners and he, we have some kind of dispute. I think he stole some money. Uh, instead of trying to work that out between us, or, if we can't, because I think I'm right, you think you're right, you know, we find a spiritual brother to work that out between us, we go to court, we go to small claims court. Well, now we've aired our dirty laundry, we brought, we've kind of undone a lot of work that probably took years of work and reputation that we were trying to build in the community. Another thing would be, um, uh, you know, this, this is really common in cases, I guess, of marital disputes, right? Where somebody may take somebody else to court. Somebody did somebody wrong, we're going to take somebody to court. Well, I'm not saying that that may never, there are certain laws, you know, we have to abide by the laws of the land and by the laws of God. And if somebody is doing something uh, illegally, that by law we have to report, then we would have to report that. But, but it does give us pause, doesn't it, to, to think, you know, what, maybe there's some of these things that we're taking to people to court for that would be frivolous that we should... Uh, settle outside and not bring shame on the church. And the idea here is can we not resolve the problems among us? And, and that's what's supposed to give us pause to think about. Well, let's turn uh, to his next section here, verses 7 through 8, which is shame on these two brethren. He says in verse 7 that it's already a defeat for them. Let me read verses 7 and 8. He says, actually then, it's already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud. You do this even to your shame. And, and it's kind of a, you know, when I read this and read this and read this, I, oft, I always missed what he's saying here because I ask, how was it already a defeat for them? But when you go to court with somebody, aren't you trying to win? You know, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to go to court and win their side of the argument. And he's saying you've already lost before you even got your judgment in court. Uh, the fact that you're having cases against each other, whatever the outcome is, you've already failed. You've already lost. Courts are based on the principle of legal retaliation, aren't they? And that goes against the principles of Christ, which is forgiveness, peace, and unity. And so uh, let's say me and Grant, I'm not picking on you, Grant, but me and Grant have a, a case where uh, he says, I stole something from him. I'll be the bad guy in this case. And I say, well, I'm going to try to get away with this thing. Or, then we're going to go to court. We've already lost, even, even, if, even if you win that you've lost. So he asked two rhetorical questions. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? Now, in our mind, when we apply this to ourselves, 
See, this passage doesn't get preached that much. We just kind of skim right over it because if it ever happened to us, you know what we would say? Yes, I know this, but... And we would justify why we were going to dismiss this teaching. We'd say, but you don't know what they did to me. But, you know, I know Paul was saying that, but, you know, I'm, I'm justified in this. And he says, why not rather be wrong? Romans 12 and verse 17, he says, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. And going down in verse 21, he says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so that's what the wisdom of Christ would teach us in this situation when we're wronged by our brethren. He says, the next question was, why not rather be defrauded? And this follows the teaching of Matthew in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 40, where Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. I mean, that's directly like what Jesus said uh, in his Sermon on the Mount. And also in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, which I think kind of gives the overarching reason why we would do this, because Christ is our example, starting in verse 19, 1 Peter 2, 19. says, For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. Meaning you're suffering some kind of injustice or injustice. And we're talking about uh, human justice versus godly justice. Verse 20, for what credit is there if, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if, when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently, if you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So I know that's a hard, hard thing to ask, but that's what God is expecting us to do, to be wronged, to be, to be willing to be wronged, to be willing to be defrauded. And we need to ask ourselves this question. We live in a society which, you know, is you got to stand up for your rights, you know. But we need to ask ourselves in every situation, do we care more about our rights or do we care more about what Christ thinks is right? So in verse 8, he says, but you, and now I think he's turning his attention to the other person. He's, he's, he's talking to the plaintiff and now he's talking to the, the defendant, the person who did wrong. But you, you do injustice. And you defraud. Now, it's interesting here that the word you is plural. Uh, I know you can't see that in the English, but actually he's addressing the whole congregation here, saying that this may be, he's indicating that this is probably a problem beyond just the two people who are arguing. This is the kind of behavior that they exhibit. And he says, and, and much worse, you're doing this among your own brethren. So even if you, the, the, the moral of the story was, even if you get away with this, even if you, perhaps stole something from somebody, you went to court and you won, you still lost because you did what was wrong and God's not pleased with you. So the plaintiff can only win by enduring the loss and the defendant can only win by making, you know, making it right back to his brethren, by making peace to his brother. This is opposite of what the world teaches. In this case, they both win by losing. Um, does that make sense? But, but that's opposite from what the world teaches us, to get what is ours. And, and uh, they did me wrong, and so I want restitution. Because ultimately what we're looking for is God to be glorified. Handle things internally, even if it means us taking wrong and, and, and uh, accepting wrong just to have uh, peace. But externally we're trying to glorify God and have an influence in our communities. So verses 9 through 11. This is... Uh, turning to, to the whole church now. Let me go back to 1 Corinthians. Lost my place. In 1 Corinthians, starting in verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So let's look at this and break it down. He, he, he starts out this section with a question. He says, have you not known? Meaning it's a rhetorical question, meaning that they should have known it. And he, have you noticed there's a pattern here? That he's asking these rhetorical questions to get him to realize things. So now he's turning his attention to the whole church. He says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, but we lose a little play on words here because that word that's, that's unrighteous really means unjust. And we're talking about justice. Justice within the church, justice in God's eyes, 
justice versus justice in a court of law. He's saying those who are unjust will not inherit the kingdom of God. Back in verse 8, he, he says, you do injustice, you do injustice and you defraud your brethren. So I just want to make it clear that unjust means unrighteous. And God is the one defining what is just, what is good, what is right. And so we don't really think about what these words mean sometimes, but righteous just means doing what's right. And being uh, just just means doing what's right, doing what is good, doing what is... Uh, so and the whole idea with a courtroom is the court is supposed to decide right. But that's not always the case. Uh, God defines that. So, here he's warning them and asking them a question, or begs the question, can we escape God's judgment if we continue in sin? And so he's saying, don't be deceived. And he said this before, earlier, in a, in a previous chapter, I think in chapter 2 or chapter 3. And when he says this, he says this because it's possible to be deceived. Uh, have you not ever uh, known something was a sin, but you kept doing it? deceiving yourself into thinking that it was okay or that it wasn't that big of a sin. That's what he's trying to get them to point out. Don't be deceived that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he lists a laundry list. Now, we've already talked about, talked about earlier in the letter about fornicators. That means sexually immoral. He talked about the guy that was with his father's wife having a, a sexual immorality that wasn't even among the Gentiles. There's th this is a whole laundry list of anything that's not sexually pure, any kind of sexual relations outside of marriage. He talked about idolaters. He's talked about adulterers. This is people sleeping, uh, you know, ha having sexual relations with people who are married. Now, these two words are, are interesting, effeminate and homosexual. Now, this one we, we've all heard of, but this one we may not have heard of. This actually comes from the word meaning soft, but it is the... Um, it's the, if I, I don't want to be crude in this, but it's the submissive partner in a homosexual relationship. Whereas this is the uh, dominant partner in a homosexual relationship. And so it was very common in, in Greek culture for, for people, especially younger, younger males, to submit to these kind of relationships. And he's saying, you know, this is wrong as well as this, you know, regardless of what side you're on. And... He goes into other kinds of sins. He's talking about thieves, people who rob. This is usually by force. People who are greedy. Your translation may say coveted. This means wanting above and beyond what, is, what is, uh, you should be content with. Uh, that, that is, uh, I guess, an extension of greediness would be robbing people. Perhaps not being content would lead somebody to be uh, a drunkard as well. This is people who are not sober. They're, they're being intoxicated. And, and the, I'm just defining these because sometimes we may think we know what they mean, but, but this is what the original Greek words mean. Revilers is, a, is a, one we don't talk about that much. This is somebody who's slanderous, somebody who's abusive in their speech towards other people. Um, uh, you know, instead of uh, you know, saying things that aren't true or just saying things in an abusive, insulting manner. And this is swindlers, people who would cheat people. Maybe not at force, but maybe would, in a business dealing would cheat people. So there's a whole laundry list of sins. I mentioned Romans 1, 24 through 32. There's another long laundry list of sins there as well, if you ever wanted to read that. We don't have time for that today. But so this is not a complete list of people who will, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But most likely, these are some of the problems that they were having in Corinth. He's reminding them that these people would not inherit the kingdom of God. So what do we do if we've committed these sins? What about those who have already committed the sins? We're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? Well, that's not true because we have forgiveness through Christ. And so he kind of brings a, a message of hope in verse 11 and 12. He says, these things, some of, you know, you were some of these things. And literally, word for word in the Greek, it, it, it says, these things some of you would be. Meaning, implying, you would still be some of these if it wasn't for Christ. And he says, you got, you basically, you were washed. And literally, in the original language, it's, you got yourself washed. Now, there's some, there's some, uh, I guess, theological debate about who did the washing here. Because most, most translators translate this, you were washed. If you look at your Bible, it probably says that. But the, the literal, I guess if you're going to translate it literally, it means you got yourselves washed. It doesn't mean that we, we remove our own sin, but 
I believe this is a reference to when we submit to baptism. We, we submit to that process. We get ourselves washed. Uh, definitely, it's an allusion to that, I believe. But he's ultimately talking about washing ourselves from the filth of all these sins. You were sanctified. We have talked about sanctification and justification earlier in the letter. Meaning, you were made holy. You were set apart to be holy. And he says, you were justified. So we got, you would be some of these sinners, but, but, but. Three things happened. You got yourself washed, and as a result, you were sanctified, you were made holy, you were justified, meaning you were made right, you were made just in the eyes of God. And so... Paul is providing, even after that condemning message, he's providing a ray of hope in the form of a reminder of who they are. Earlier in the letter, remember, he said, you're spiritual people, you have gifts of the Spirit, so act spiritual. Now he's saying, you're people who are washed, justified, and sanctified, so start acting like it. Stop bringing shame on yourself, stop bringing shame on the church, start handling your problems internally, because they've been washed, sanctified, and justified. And he, he, knows, he, he implicates how this was happening in verse 11. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. So this is by the authority of Christ. You know, when we're, we're baptized into Christ, uh, and as Acts 2.38 and following says, we'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The transformation happens through the Spirit as we submit to his word and make transformations in our life. We're forgiven of our sins. And so that's the outline of the chapter. I'm going to stop there in verse 11, and we'll pick up there next week. But remember how this, this chapter is broken out. It's First, he's talking about how it brings shame on the church for us to take our problems outside of it. It brings shame on us as individuals who are claiming to be you know, spiritual people, but we can't handle our own problems internally. And then there's a warning against all wrongdoers that none, none of us who continue in sin will inherit uh, the kingdom of heaven. So the question that, as way of invitation is, have you got yourself washed? Uh, are you still living in sin, or have you become washed uh, to, to remove your sins? Now, to do that, uh, we have to obey the gospel. We have to believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins. Uh, we, so we repent of our sins, meaning we're willing to turn away from our sins. Uh, we are baptized into Christ. And we, you know, then uh, we become sanctified. We become justified or made right. So we have, have you been sanctified and justified? And if you have, are you acting like it? Because that's ultimately what Paul is, is writing to the Corinthians about. He's writing to the church of, of Christians, but he's trying to get them to act like the Christians who they already should be. And that's my, my call or invitation to us all this morning is let's act like the people that God has called us to be. And let's be the people of Christ. We're not always going to be perfect, but when we, when we fail, let's repent and, and let's have peace among one another. If we have disputes among one another, I don't think this has been a problem here. I don't know anybody going to court of law against anyone here. But these things could come up, and you may, sometime in your Christian life, you may experience these things. So if there's, a, if there's anything we can do for anyone this morning, if you've never been washed, you've never been uh, sanctified and justified in Christ, we invite you to do that this morning. If you need to repent of anything and need the prayers of the saints, we invite you to do that as well as we stand and sing the song of invitation.